What's up, my meeps? I can say that, right? It's not, it's not trademarked if I abbreviate the word. Kyle McCarley here with another list of my favorite board games. And today, I want to talk about some stuff that still gets a little bit of a bad rap. You see, when you think of great board games, chances are you think of stuff that's got a theme that's a completely new idea. Or maybe it's based on something in the public domain. My point is, though, that it's not often that somebody's favorite board game is based on a licensed IP. Because really, who's impressed with SpongeBob Monopoly? <laughs> but there are, especially in recent years, some great licensed games out there. And I want to go through a handful of my favorites for you, in case the justifiable stigma has had you shying away from them. So, let's get started with my favorite board games based on licensed properties. Number 10. Okay, it might be a little bit cheeky of me to include this one on this list, but I think it counts because the publishers of the game had to buy the rights to the name in order to use it. Blockbuster The Party Game. It's a very simple movie title trivia game, best played with a group of film buffs, but it makes the list because the theming on it is spot on. You get a fun little signpost mini to fill you with nostalgia, and it even comes in a box designed to replicate the old VHS boxes they had. And it even sucks at closing, just like the real thing. Number nine. The next game on my list is a co-op game. It was my late friend Billy Kometz's gateway board game, Trogdor. Perhaps technically not a licensed game if you want to split hairs because the creators of Homestar Runner were part of the design team, but I think it counts for the spirit of the list. Players collectively control the dragon Trogdor and try to help him burninate the countryside and smash through all the cottages. Little bit challenging, but a great game for any child of the early aughts who misses their strong bad emails. Number eight. Up next is a license that comes from the tabletop gaming space, but after this one we'll get to games nobody can argue with, I swear. Betrayal at Baldur's Gate. Betrayal at House on the Hill is a modern classic of a board game that came out all the way back in 2004, and it's great, but it has its flaws. Betrayal at Baldur's Gate takes the core concept of that game and moves it into the realm of Dungeons and Dragons and it makes some major improvements on some of the mechanics that weren't ideal. These improvements were so good, they kept them for Betrayal at House on the Hill's third edition. If you like D&D and you like Betrayal, this one's a no-brainer. Number seven. Next up is the first one from my favorite development team, formerly known as Prospero Hall, who specialize in licensed games like this. Seriously, it wouldn't be hard to make this whole list out of their portfolio. Back to the Future, Back in Time. This is a co-op game for one to four where you control Marty, Doc, Jennifer, and or the dog Einstein. And basically, you try to achieve the same objectives Marty had in the first movie. This game is a prime example of Prospero Hall coming up with interesting mechanics that fit the theme flawlessly. If you like co-op games and you like Back to the Future, this one's definitely worth checking out. Number six. This one is a rare two-player game I've had the chance to check out. And from what I hear, because I haven't played a bunch of them, one of the best Star Wars games ever released. Star Wars Rebellion. Set early on after the birth of the Rebel Alliance, so probably somewhere during the run of Star Wars Rebels, one player controls the Empire, and one controls the Rebellion. The Rebels will try to garner enough support throughout the galaxy to convince people that maybe the Emperor's not such a good dude, and the Empire will try to hunt down and destroy the Rebel base before they can do that. Definitely on the crunchy side, so I don't recommend it if heavy board games aren't your jam. But if they are, you will love this one, especially if you're a Star Wars fan. Number five. My next couple of picks 
might be a little controversial because I haven't seen a lot of people talking about these games, but I personally love them. Part of the reason I love this one so much is probably because I love the source material. Dead by Daylight, the board game. I've sadly only had the opportunity to play it once, but I loved it enough that after we shipped off that copy to a giveaway winner, I tracked down the collector's edition so I could get my hands on the better minis, the couple extra maps, and the massive upgrade in the killer selection. This board game somehow manages to successfully capture the feel of Dead by Daylight without mechanically resembling the video game in the slightest. Still, a very fun game. And while I'm sure the Venn diagram of DVD fans who also love board games doesn't have a ton of overlap, those who fit into it will quite like this one. Number four. This next one is based on a series of graphic novels I wasn't familiar with until I'd played the game. But I loved the theme so much, I immediately went and picked them up so I could read them all over the next few days. The Stuff of Legend. A semi-co-op hidden role game for three to six players. You play as toys whose boy has been kidnapped by the boogeyman, and you have to enter his domain to try to rescue the boy, working together to gather information while fending off the boogeyman's army. But there's at least a 50-50 chance that one or more of your group are secretly working for the boogeyman. Very difficult game for the good guys to win, in my experience, but the theme is fantastic. And I highly recommend the comics if you get the chance to pick them up, too. I'm not even a comic book guy. Number three. The second entry I've got from the team at Prospero Hall, and the only way this one's controversial is if people think I haven't ranked it highly enough, because this is the game that put those guys on the map. Disney Villainous. A fantastic and inventive asymmetrical game for two to six players, though it's probably best played with four or less. You take on the role of a classic Disney villain trying to achieve their nefarious goal, while simultaneously doing whatever you can to thwart the other villains in finishing their own objectives before you. There have now been eight expansions in the series that introduce more villains to the Pantheon, along with the Marvel Villainous and Star Wars Villainous reskins, but you'll definitely want to start with the original if you haven't already given it a shot. I don't think the Prospero Hall team stuck around for most of those later installments, and at least based on my experience playing Marvel Villainous, you can tell. Number two. Coming in at my second spot, I've got a co-op game that really surprised me with how much fun it is. Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid. One to five players take on the role of one of the original Power Rangers to fight off Rita Repulsa and her putties to save Angel Grove. Man, I loved that show as a kid, but the fact that Zordon recruited teenagers to try to save the planet from an evil alien lady who, for some reason, insisted on attacking their hometown pretty much exclusively is real hard for my suspension of disbelief as an adult. In spite of that, this board game is a lot of fun, and it does a nice job of capturing the vibe of the source material. Number one. My personal favorite licensed game is a weird one. Not because I think it's weird to like this game, although I'm sure I'm in the minority ranking it quite this high, but because it was a weird choice for a licensed IP. But the Prospero Hall guys were working for Funko, who seemed to give them free reign to use whatever licenses they had. Right up until they sold off the only profitable portion of their company for parts, and pretty much the whole team got let go. Really looking forward to seeing what they do under their new Tempest Workshop banner. Anyway, Rear Window, released in 2022 and based on the Hitchcock movie from nearly 70 years prior. This game is pretty much Mysterium in a neater package. It's also got a twist where the person giving the clues might actually not be steering you to the correct answers on everything, which I think overcomplicates things unnecessarily, but it could be fun to play with a group of savvy gamers once you've gotten the hang of things. Pretty limitless replay value, and it does fit the theme fairly well, but it's also just a really great co-op game. and an honorable mention to another game that only barely fits the criteria for this list. Um, actually, the board game. 
I've barely played this game the way the rule book intends. It's also fun to just grab a card and read it to your friends and see if they can figure out what's wrong with it. Um Actually is a great game show on the Dropout streaming service, and this game very successfully captures that concept in a box for you to take home and play with your friends. Great fun. And that is my list of my very favorite licensed board games. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. I am certain there's going to be some thoughts on this one. Because I know there are some notable licensed games I haven't gotten the chance to try yet. But of the ones I have played, these are the best as far as I'm concerned. Give me your favorites though. I want to know which games I need to add to the collection on the Maybe I'll Play This Someday shelf. Also, do us a favor, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, turn on your notifications. Don't miss all the how-tos and reviews and other fun stuff we're posting here on this channel. We've got some new ideas we're kicking around and something cool is coming soon, I guarantee it. And don't miss our live show, The Board and Barrel, every Sunday night at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks for hanging with me and I'll see you soon.